Folks, hello, my name is Giles. My God, you know what? This is exciting. It's exciting to see human beings. I know, I know, I'm sure everyone has said this. I'm sure everyone has said this every time you've gone, but it is exciting to, 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 to see human beings. I haven't been in this lecture theater for, uh, for two years, and I teach, I teach the first year um, me medical students here. In fact, I'm going to teach you some first year medicine, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Giles Yeo, and I'm a geneticist uh, based here, and, and, and I study body weight. Um, I study, actually, I study obesity, uh, body weight of which obesity sits on one end of the spectrum, but that's not that talk today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about calories, okay? And so welcome everybody uh, in person, welcome everybody on, online. And as, because you can't avoid it, any radio channel, any TV channel, any newspaper you would have picked up, you know that this week it is compulsory for restaurants to actually put the uh, calorie restaurants with employees of 250 or more, including not only the, the, the waiting staff, everyone in it, has to, is now compulsory to put cal calorie counts um, out there. I, I'm not saying that I'm already giving away the punchline just, just on, on, on that, but I think it's slightly more nuanced. I'm, I'm not here uh, as, a, as any kind of tirade, but, but, and this wasn't by chance, right? In fact, I didn't know it was happening on Monday. Then it suddenly happened on Monday, and my, my phone has not stopped ringing off the, um, off, off, off the hook. So it's a good time to be here. I've thought, I've thought about things, and maybe you're getting a crisper um, crystallization of my thoughts since I've had to talk at people all, all week. So guys, thank you so much for being here on a Friday evening at six o'clock. You guys need to question your life decisions. But anyway, <laughs> so we're here. And I'm here to talk about, the, uh, about this book, Why, Why Calories uh, Don't Count. So there's um, on the left-hand side, the left-hand side is the UK version, the right-hand side is the, Ameri is the American version. And look, guys, I understand, before people start chucking slippers and pears at me. Of course, I understand, ladies and gentlemen, that 200 calories of chips is twice the portion of 100 calories of chips. We understand this. But so is 200 grams of chips, twice the portion of 100 grams of chips. And no one is trying to compare 200 grams of chips to 200 grams of carrots. Okay, I'll leave that there for a moment. I'll work through that sentence and, 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 that, and that argument um, um, slightly. But calorie counts are ubiquitous. As of this week, they're even more ubiquitous. Okay, so now these uh, calorie counts are on the packaged food, which is interesting in of itself. We can come back and talk about the calorie counts on, on the menus later in Q&A. But 90%, so I'll give you some editorial now. 90% of our food that we face, roughly speaking, comes from the supermarket, I'd like to think. Maybe some of you eat out very often. But for the vast majority of us, we get our food foraged from the supermarket. And this is the information we get on there, right? So here are where the calorie counts are. So they're already there, because by law, Anything that is prepackaged, this is, this is not necessarily true, obviously, for broccoli and things, but, but that's not a problem. No one, no one is saying broccoli is a problem. But for the prepackaged stuff, here's what we have. So the, on the left-hand side is UK, EU um, compliant labeling. The right-hand side is a US FDA labeling. And so there are a number of things, just, just to point out. I've highlighted where the energy is, is, because calorie is a unit of energy. So in the UK compliant, well, actually, let's start with the FDA, because that's the simplest, because it says calories. It's spelled with a capital C, which is relevant. We'll come back to that in a second, all right? And then on the left-hand side, it becomes slightly more complicated. The top, the top bit is the back-of-pack labeling, and some version of this will exist in any prepackaged food in the, in the UK and the EU. And you see that the energy amounts they give are in, two, are in two units. They're in KJ and they're in KCAL. We'll come back and work on nomenclature in three, in three seconds. Um, and then the bottom is front of pack labeling. And you can either get it in, in monochrome or you can get it in the traffic light signaling, highlighting what, um, the, uh, what is perceived to be the evils, the sins that we should be focusing, um, that we should be focusing on in our, in our food. And obviously red is bad, green is good, amber is somewhere, um, sub somewhere in the middle. Okay, so let's work through just some nomenclature. Don't worry, this is not a, this is not a science lecture. I, I know I'm gonna drive people, say, but, but let's work, let's work on, on, on uh, so that we understand what the hell we're talking about. What is a calorie? A calorie, originally used to measure heat, okay? The heat calorie is a small c calorie. It's spelt with a small c, all right? I know. And it is the amount of heat it takes to raise one milliliter of water, one degree Celsius at sea level. 
okay? But all of the calories we're talking about in the book, we're talking about calorie labeling, it's not the heat calorie, it is the food calorie, which is what I'm gonna call it. And the food calorie is otherwise known as a big C calorie. So in other words, it's spelt with a big C, which I always found to be ridiculous, because how do you pronounce a small C calorie? <laughs> calorie. How do you pronounce a big C calorie? calorie. So it's completely useless to my mind, but that this is why it is a big C calorie uh, in terms of um, in the American labeling, but it is 1,000 small C calories. Okay, and this matters because it means it's one, it's the amount of energy it takes to raise one liter of water, 1,000 mils, one degree Celsius at sea level. And so in terms of the UK, EU compliant labeling, a, a, a food calorie is a kilo calorie, a kilo small, which is a kcal. That's where the kcal actually comes from, all right? But kcal, or capital C calorie. Now, what about the kj? So this is the SI unit, okay? Now, because calories are not the SI unit, and one calorie, the small c calorie, is 4.184 joules. Um, but if you then, let's go to the food calorie, that's, that's 4.2, roughly, kilojoules, or kj and that's where the KJ comes from. So if you take any KJ number and divide by 4.2, you'll get the calorie number. But aside from that, clear as mud, I know, I'm, I, whenever I refer to the term calorie for the whole evening, this, this, this evening, I'm talking about one kilocalorie uh, or 4.2 kilojoules or one big C calorie. Fantastic, so why don't calories count? Um, and so, this is, the, this is not actually an equation, but let's call it an equation just for sake of argument. A, the number of calories actually in the food do not equal the number of calories on the back of the pack or now the number of calories on your menu, all right? Which is B, which does not equal C, the number of actual usable calories we're finally able to get out of the food. And so the, the talk is gonna be structured and just talking through each of A, B, how do we get to A, how do we get to B, and crucially, and, and, and really, I hope the take home message is how the hell we get to, pardon me, how we get to C, all right, in, 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 in terms of that. So let's deal with this. So why are they not equal? Given that I've just told you that a calorie is the amount of energy it takes to raise one liter of water, um, one degree Celsius, Aren't they all the same, right? Isn't that, well, then it's a unit of heat. Surely it is all the same. Yes, it is all the same once it is in you as a little poof of energy, okay? Once you've actually fought through the food and got the calorie out, it is exactly equal. The problem is we don't eat calories, we eat food, okay? And then our body has to deal with the food. And it's down to the caloric availability of the food. So the caloric availability of food is the amount of calories you're able to pull out of the food versus the total number of calories that are actually stuck in the food. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. Sugar, let's just take, it's our base fuel, okay? So imagine if we had 100 calories of sugar. The availability of sugar is roughly speaking 97 to 98%, which means that for every 100 calories of sugar that you actually eat, you'll extract 98, 97 to 98 calories of, of, of out of it, usability. That's what I mean by caloric availability, all right? So that's one extreme. Now, how about sweet corn or corn on the cob? And we all know that when we've eaten 100 calories of sweet corn and we've looked in the loo the next day, that we have absorbed nowhere close to 100 calories of sweet corn, okay? And so this is, this is true. But yet, if we take sweet corn, 100 calories of sweet corn, or however much, we desiccate it, we kind of grind it into a cornmeal, we make a corn tortilla, we make cornbread, and suddenly, a vast majority, we are able to extract a vast majority more of the calories compared to just eating sweet corn. It's exactly the same source of food, right? Corn. But yet, what you do to it, how you process it, we'll come back and talk about that in a second, influences how many calories we can actually get up. All right, so I've given slightly extreme examples here, but this is in effect the problem. When we talk about food, it makes a very big difference if we're talking about 100 calories of sugar or 100 calories of sweet corn. We don't deal with the food in, in, in the same way, even if the calories are equal. So let's get to A. How do we actually understand how many calories there are in food? Okay, so the way we do this is using a technique called bomb calorimetry. And it is, we still use it today, we use it scientifically, okay? We use it to burn poop, no, normally, we get that. And, and so bomb calorimetry is as unsophisticated as it sounds. The bomb, the eponymous bomb, is a sealed container, 
Okay, it's a pressurized sealed container, and it's pressurized up to 30 atmospheres, 30 times the uh, sea, sea, sea level pressure, with pure oxygen. Why? So that whatever you put in there and burn, it will burn to completion. You, you completely carbonize the item of food that you're going to put into the bomb calorimeter. All right? Surrounding the bomb calorimeter, the, the bomb, pardon me, is a water jacket. It's just a, a, a volume of known water that's actually surrounding it. And so what you do is in bomb calorimetry, which is the whole, which is the whole device, you put an item of desiccated food into, into, the, uh, into the bomb. Why desiccated? Why dried? Because H2O, water, has no energetic value to, to living beings. If you were a nuclear power reactor, H2O would have, uh, um, you know, obviously a, a power to you. We're not, okay? And so you can just desiccate the food and it burns, stuff burns easier. And all you do is you burn the given grams of food and you measure what temperature the water goes up. That's it. And so it's really how much heat does a given amount of food give off, and that is how you get to the total number of calories within, um, um, within the food, okay? Why are not all calories equal? Because we are not bomb calorimeters, okay? The way we extract energy from food is through digestion, which aside from the acidic cauldron that is our stomach, is actually a relatively gentle process. It's one long chemical, 24-hour chemical reaction in, in, in effect. We don't torch our, our food. So that's how we get to A, all right? Uh, um, still done like that today, has not got more sophisticated than, um, 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 than that. But how do we get to B then? How do we, therefore, understand what's at the back of the pack? Is it the bomb calorimetry numbers? No, it's not, okay? So how do we get to B? Well, to get to B, I need to introduce you to a chap named Wilbur Olin Atwater, the most American of names I want to point out, but that's because he was American. So Wilbur, or Professor Atwater, was a professor of chemistry in Wesleyan University in Connecticut, okay? Between 1880 and 1900. So this is quite a while ago now. And he had spent some time in Germany understanding calorimetry, uh, which was actually invented by German, by German scientists to look at agriculture. They were interested in how much food you fed a cow, what comes out the other side, and, and so how much milk and meat that you could actually produce. That's where calorimetry actually originally um, um, came from. So Atwater, Professor Atwater, was spent a sabbatical in Germany and then went back to Connecticut and decided that, hmm, he appreciated the, the sweet corn phenomenon. Okay, he understood the sweet corn phenomenon. So he wanted to know, well, how much food, when we eat, do we as human beings actually absorb? And so this is probably where he, 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 done, he, he has done a number of different things. But this item of research I'm about to tell you about is his greatest contribution to nutritional science, okay? Over 20 years, he did this. And I want you to reflect upon this whenever you think about complaining about your job again, all right? So what he did was he was interested in, in, in how much food, how much energy we would absorb from a given food that we ate. So what he did was, first of all, he got different types of food, steaks, celery, et cetera, et cetera, and he burnt them, okay? So that he could then understood what the um, what was it called? The uh, heat of combustion. This is, this is the calories were. And he just did, and he published these tables, okay? Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, of, of different items of food. He then fed these foods to human volunteers and then burnt their poo <laughs> for 20 years, all right? So now, Exactly, reflect. So now we know how much, we know how much uh, calories there are in a steak, a sweet corn, etc., etc. We know what came out the other side. Hence, we know what went in. All right? So based on that, I won't, I won't take you through these in detail. Based on that, he then, in effect, came up with these numbers. They're called the Atwater General Factors. And for those of you who've studied GCSE biology, you would have, you would have memorized this. And these are the factors we all wrote by rote uh, 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 repeat, which is four calories for every given gram of carbohydrate, four calories for a gram of protein, and nine calories for fat. For those of you who ask, he also did alcohol. That's seven grams. Uh, seven calories for every gram. We'll leave alcohol out of this uh, for now. And these at water factors, these 944 factors, which are, by the way, sort of a, uh, uh, an, an, an estimate. Now, I won't take you through the numbers, but you know, because it depends what kind you're eating, how much, was it a man, was it a woman, was it a child? He took an average. But these 944 numbers are how every single calorie count on every single packet all over the world today and on your restaurant menus are calculated, 
all right? From numbers that were based from 120 years ago with Atwater doing a pretty good job, I have, I have to point out. Now, the issue with these, uh, um, the, you see a wobble. I know what you guys are going to do now. You guys are going to go, when, when you finish, you're going to go and just say, I bet you he's lying. He's, uh, I'm not, okay? But there is a wobble. There is a bit of a wobble. The numbers are not exactly 994, 944, pardon me. And the reason behind that is because there is a little bit of wobble for how you estimate how much protein there is in food. And different people do it in, 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 in different ways. I won't bore you with the details for that, but that is the explanation for the wobble. But in effect, all of nutritional caloric science is based on Atwater and his 944 um, um, numbers. And that is how we get to the numbers at the back of the packet, all right? But this is history, okay? The problem is not that, because, because Atwater took into account the sweet corn phenomenon. That's fine. But he never, okay, took into account this final step. Had the number of usable calories were actually able to get out of the food, irregardless of what it actually says at the back of the, at the, at the, back of the pack. And the reason behind this is because of two particular components of food. One, of protein, and two, of fiber. I'll, I'll explain why, why, why in a second. And these influence the way our body deals with the food, and hence the way our body actually extracts the calories, um, extracts the calories from the food. So let's focus on protein, protein first, which is actually one of the macronutrients. Fiber is not. It's important to us, but it's not a macronutrient. Protein is. So let's think, think about protein. So focusing just on protein, a calorie of protein makes you feel fuller than a calorie of fat, than a calorie of carb, in that order, okay? And, and nutritional science has, uh, dietitians have understood this. Protein, people say protein is more satiating, and it is. You can't eat that much of a steak if you don't have all the carbs and everything ne ne next to it. You get full pretty quickly because protein is calorie for calorie more satiating. So the question is why? There are two steps that we take, so I said we eat food, we don't eat calories. So how do we extract the calories from the food? There are two steps, two stages. The first step is digestion. Okay, this is the stage in which we eat. This is the food to poop uh, a tube. And, and this is where we eat and it gets to the intestinal wall and our foods, depending on what we're eating, protein are broken down into amino acids, carbs are broken down into sugars, and um, fat are broken down into fatty acids, okay? And then they cross the gut wall. That is digestion. So Atwater took into account digestion when it actually came to it. But what then happened, so, and, but what he didn't take into account was this, with the hormones that are released during digestion. And pretty much, food that takes longer to digest makes you feel fuller, okay? And so protein, and fiber, actually, because fiber we can't digest at all. But protein, because it's more chemically complex than carbs and than fat, just takes longer to digest. It travels further down the gut. And for every mouthful of food we eat, and it goes down the tube, hormones are released all throughout the entire process, which signal to the brain. And most gut hormones make you feel full, largely speaking. But there are 20 different gut hormones, and the repertoire of gut hormones tells your brain how much protein, fat, and carbs you've actually eaten. But protein makes you feel fuller. Okay, so while Atwater calculated the actual calorie, he didn't, never took into account the fact that protein makes you feel fuller because of the hormones that, that, that are actually there. So this is not a calorie thing. The second thing is metabolism, okay? So let me take a little interlude just for a second as we consider metabolism. Have you, we've talked about heats of combustion, which is energy, which is how much it actually takes. Have you guys given any thought into how much energy goes into making a cup of tea? Right? Making just boiling a kettle. Let's just for assumption, for easy maths, say it's a liter. Most kettles are like a liter and a half. Say, say a liter, you're not, it's not a full kettle. So how much uh, um, you know, energy does it take? Well, if one calorie, not if, since one calorie is one, one degree Celsius, one liter, boiling is 100 uh, uh, degrees Celsius, it only takes 100 calories to boil a kettle of water. And you're thinking, 100 calories, are you serious? Yep, and not only that, it's less than that, because this is going from zero degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. Your water comes out of the tap at 15 degrees, or whatever. And so it probably only takes 85 calories to actually boil a kettle of water. And 100 calories, we'll go back to 100 for, for, for now, is roughly speaking the number of calories you find in an egg, a, a medium-sized hen's egg. Now given that we eat between two to 3,000 calories a day, that's enough, if at, at 2,000, that's enough to boil 20 liters of water from freezing to boiling. So how come when we eat food, we don't boil? 
Okay, and, and right, because we only carry within us, there are only five liters of blood in us. Okay, roughly speaking, depending on your size, of course. How come we're not boiling, right? So the answer is we don't, we're not bond. If we took 2,000 calories of food and put it into a bomb calorimeter, it would be enough to boil. It would be enough to actually boil 20 liters of water. But we're not, as I keep saying, we're not furnaces. We're not bonfires. And we metabolize the food. And we metabolize the food into little units of usable energy. So this is now where I get into big chemistry. Okay? And in particular, we use uh, um, and we recycle this item called adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, for those of you doing GCSE biology. And so the critical bit about ATP, so there is the little uh, adenosine area, the critical bit is in the triphosphate or three phosphate groups. And the reason it's important is because the amount of energy it takes to squash these phosphate groups together is a lot. Okay, and so there are, and due to conservation of energy, you don't destroy the energy, it's tied in there. So there is a high energy bond. Now the bottom line is, if you consider ATP to be a charged battery, and you break the bond on ATP, num on phosphate number three, and it kind of pops off, it releases a poof of energy, and it becomes ADP, adenosine diphosphate, because now you only have two phosphate groups. But every time you do this, a little poof of energy comes on and you can then do whatever, whatever it is you're actually, you're actually doing. Now, there are probably between four to five grams of ATP in us at any one given time. But we go through in a 24-hour period, for me, I'm 75 kilos, we go through our own body weight in ATP recycled every single day. So I go through, seven, my body goes through 75 kilograms of ATP ATP, ADP, ADP, ATP, ATP, ADP. So the, what happens with metabolism is you therefore put the energy into ADP to make ATP. Then when you need it, poof, it gives off. Five grams recycled, 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 75 kilos of ATP every single day, which is why we don't boil, because our 2,000 calories is divided into 75 kilograms worth of ATP over, over a 24-hour period. So, and I, I know I'm scaring everybody. So for any of you who have done who have taken any biochemistry course with me or have done medicine or have done biochemistry, this might trigger PTSD. But this is otherwise <laughs> known as intermediary metabolism. It is, it is metabolism, okay? Now, when you actually eat food, um, two things happen with food. Uh, uh, amino acids, protein, fatty acids, or, or sugars. You can either burn it or you can store it. Those are the two items. You can't sweat it out. Okay? You, 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 can't, you can't do all kinds of things, detox it, you have to use it or burn it, uh, burn it or store it. Those are the two things you can, actually, you can actually do. Now, when you're dealing with fat and carbs, they're very simple, chemically, because they're made 100% of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Those three atoms, that's it. So, and it's just in different configurations. And so when you're burning or storing, and you need to move the stuff about to, to, to actually store it, it's very, very easily done because you just, you're just shuffling atoms, atoms around. The problem with protein, and this is the issue which I'm going to get to, is the protein also contains carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but crucially, it also contains a significant amount of nitrogen, on average 16%. So what happens is there is no, in our body, we eat quite a bit of protein, but there is no store of protein like there is a store of fat or a store of glycogen in our body. Protein is all active. Okay? It's either used for, if you're lifting, if you're building muscles, used for repairing damage. There is no store of inert protein. So any protein that's not immediately being used has to be stored as fat because all energy is stored as fat. But you've got to strip out the nitrogen. And so the nitrogen is stripped out as uric acid, urea, and you wee it out, all right? And then, then the skeleton that's left of amino acids can go in and generate energy. The whole process of that costs a lot of energy, okay, is, the, is my point of, of, of this. So for every 100 calories of protein that you eat, this is at water calories, 100 calories of protein, you're only ever able to absorb 70 calories, seven zero, okay, of every 100 calories. So protein is, on average, okay, protein is always only 70% available. Protein calories everywhere are 30% wrong, okay? How about the other ma macronutrients? Let's deal with fat. Depressingly, fat is almost 100% available. <laughs> I know you guys are thinking, how about fat? 50%. Tell me 50%. It's not. 
So fat is very, very efficient, um, and that's why it's our long-term fuel, all right? And you can tell because you can, a candle, which is wax, which is fat, will burn forever, all right? It'll sit there and burn because it is so efficient. So sadly, 100 calories of fat is pretty much 100 calories of fat. Now, carbs are a different idea, okay, are a different phenomenon, where it depends. If you're having the powdered white stuff, sugar, then as I said, it's 97, roughly speaking, percent available. But if you're having whole meal, it's wholemeal toast, quinoa, whatever it is you like to eat, with fiber, and this is now the presence of fiber, then it's 90% available. So it takes 10% of the energy of a slice of wholemeal toast to deal with the wholemeal toast. So on average, calories are probably everywhere that you see, calories are about 10% wrong. And no one ever tells you this at the back of the pack, and no one ever tells you anything, uh, anything about this. And this is the concept of caloric availability. Now, when you then begin to think about this concept, about how we deal with the different macronutrients, there's no more biochemistry, I promise, okay? You then begin to layer it on our understanding of the world around us, in particular popular diets, which is what a, a lot of people do think about. Then you realize that caloric availability explains pretty much how most diets that work, work. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll, I'll give you the receipts now, all right? So look, I, as I said, I study obesity, and by studying obesity and body weight, the genetics of obesity and body weight, we are by its very definition studying the genetics of how our brain influences food intake, but this is not that talk, all right? And so the, the, the point is this, this energy balance clearly is you have to eat more than you burn to gain weight, and you have to burn more than you eat to lose weight. Now before people start yelling at me, that is physics. It has to be true. You can't get away from this. But this is the how. What we study at the Institute of Metabolic Science um, is the why. Why people behave differently around food, why people respond to stress by eating, other people respond to stress by not eating, why do some people take more food to fill up, okay? That kind of thing, that's what we study. And so the why influences the physics, the how, Therefore, people actually, therefore people actually gain, gain weight, all right? But that's, this is not that talk. The bottom line is when you need a diet to work, what is a diet that works? A diet that makes you eat less or gives a caloric imbalance is what is a diet that, that, that actually works, okay? Diets that make, manage to create a caloric, uh, calorie deficit. So you actually take it, all diets that work will fit into one or more of these three categories, and I challenge you to prove me, to prove me wrong. One, they explicitly encourage caloric restriction. Two, they're high in protein. And three, they're high in fiber. They're not mutually exclusive. You'll see things that are actually a mix of two or three of these, uh, two or three of these as well. But every single diet that works has to follow one of these rules. Okay, every single diet that works, okay, that, that, that actually. So let's deal with them. Caloric restriction is the easiest to explain. These are diets that explicitly get you to eat less. So these could be low calorie diets, okay. Now these tip, typically tend to be either you eating less or they are done in shakes. So you have these nutritionally complete shakes, Huel, th things like that, and you can have 600 calories a day and eventually you do, you, you, you do lose weight. It's unpleasant, but you do lose weight. Um, or you go to these uh, group support uh, um, scenarios, so Weight Watchers, Slim Fast, or you might do intermittent and fasting, so these are, we know how they work. They work because you end up eating fewer calories and so therefore you, you, you lose weight. The more interesting is the protein and the fiber. So let's deal with high protein. So what do I mean by high? Surprisingly, there is no industry standard for what high protein actually means. So if you actually look at all the studies that study high protein diets, on average, they're talking about the energy percentage, the percentage of, of energy you're eating from your diet as a whole, not any given meal, is 16% or more. So on average here, people, we're probably doing 15%. So anything 16% or above is considered a high-protein diet. I've listed a few of them here. So all of the hashtag LCHF diets, the low-carb, high-fat diets, and these go from um, Atkins, which is supposed to be spelled with a T, I, promise, I apologize for this, Atkins, Dukan, Southwest, Keto, and the ridiculous carnivore. So these are all um, definitely, I've listed this in order of carbo severity of carbohydrate restriction, but they're all universally high in protein. And they're very popular, keto in particular, hugely popular. And the reason why they work for weight loss, they work for other reasons as well, for glucose metabolism, but for weight loss, the reason why they work is because they're all universally high in protein, what happens when you're protein, you feel fuller. What happens when you feel fuller? You eat less, you eat less, you lose weight. Now, there are also other diets with, that are in effect LCHF, but with complicated backstories, all right? So, glu so gluten-free, 
Now, gluten-free, now, there's 1% of the human species um, are celiacs, so they're allergic to gluten. Please stay away from gluten. 3 to 4% of the human species are probably genuinely gluten intolerant, all right? And this can range anywhere from being slightly farty to, to severe intestinal distress. Probably best to stay away from gluten as well. But 25% of us, and don't deny it, okay, go out and buy gluten-free. So much so that it's now monetized. They now list items of food that never had gluten in it before, but are now gluten-free. Gluten-free rice. Rice does not have gluten. Gluten-free water. Gluten, I'm no expert, but gluten-free shampoo, right? That you can actually, that you can actually, uh, uh, that you can actually get. Anyway, the why do they work and why do so many people actually stick to gluten-free, aside from the people who clinically have to? Um, it's because if you remove gluten, you're removing actually quite a lot of grains from your, um, from your diet. It's very often mixed in with a, with a grain-free diet as well. It's relatively low carb. You have to replace the calories with something else. It's high in protein. Okay. How about paleo? I won't go on bang on forever, but paleo diet is the argument that because agriculture is only 12,000 years old, that we haven't adapted to agriculture. And so there's this, uh, you know, the, the halcyon days of Fred Flintstone, where you would go to the past and actually have your brontosaurus ribs and paleo. So it's a, it's a fantasy, and it's a fantasy because of two reasons. First of all, a paleo diet, this is not a paleo diet, right, assumes a single paleolithic human. When that is a cave, cave person, well, this is absolutely not true. Because A, were you a, a hunter-gatherer on the Serengeti? Were you a hunter-gatherer in the Amazonian rainforest? Or were you an Inuit, okay, living on the Greenland ice sheet? Now, if you're an Inuit, you'll be eating oily fish, whale blubber, not, no vegetable to be seen, because where, where are you going to find it in, in, in Greenland? You know, but then if you are on the savannah, you're probably largely vegetarian, if only because it's pretty difficult to take down an antelope, all right, <laughs> from, from that. So the, the point is humans ate whatever that, what, what was around. We're, we're like cockroaches, okay? We, 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 we actually adapted for, for that. So that's the first thing. There is no singular paleolithic diet because there's no single, singular paleolithic human. On top of that, even if we wanted to eat like cave people, we can't because everything we eat has been domesticated so much that they don't actually exist anymore. Leaving aside from that, it's high in protein. That's why people actually stick to it. But people love an epic backstory. And so you take the epic backstory, you tell them, a paleo, yeah, yeah. But actually, it's because it's, because it's, high, because it's high in protein. All right? How about fiber? So... Um, I, one of the things which I, which I do, so I'm a, I am a scientist here at the, um, I'm in Cambridge, but I also present, I moonlight, and my side hustle is I present some programs for the, for the BBC sometimes, both on radio and on TV. And this one is, I'm sadly not showing anymore, but it is, trust me, I'm a doctor, okay, which is a, which is a health program. And I was asked by the producers, this would have been probably 2018, 2019 or so, before the pandemic, and um, they said, well, w would I investigate whether or not vegan diets were, were healthy, which I was terrified because I'm a self-avowed meatitarian, but I thought, you know what, let's have a go. Don't be a, you know, don't be a child, let's, let's, let's have a go at this. And so I ended up spending um, 29 days um, being vegan. In fact, not being vegan, being plant-based. So vegan is, we know what vegan is, you don't eat anything uh, with dairy or with, or, or with eggs in it or anything with a face, as they say. Um, but I could have spent the entire time eating chips and Oreos, that would have been vegan, and that's not wouldn't be particularly healthy. Whereas if you go plant-based, then what you're doing is you're eating um, whole foods, you're, you're, you're eating pulses and beans and lentils and, and, and what have you. That's what I did. So 29 days I spent, so what were the scores on the door? Well, I ended up losing, okay, over 29 days, four kilograms, literally without trying, and I know you're thinking, no, that's not true. No, literally without, without trying. Um, four kilos, which is roughly speaking about 10, 10, 10 or 11 pounds. So the question is, how did I do it? So as it turns out, as I learned, because I was not eating um, um, chips and Oreos, I was eating beans, that actually plant-based food is pretty bulky. Okay? It takes a lot of lentils to match the calorie content of a steak. And there's only so much time in a day you can chew, right? <laughs> and so I ended up, so exactly, so you're just doing what, what you're doing. And the reason I actually ended up losing weight is because I absorb less calories. Because the caloric availability of plant-based foods is a lot less because of the presence of fiber. Okay, so this was high fiber. So this high fiber is the point. So if we then now look at the high fiber element, it doesn't have to be plant-based. It's just that plants are the source of fiber. So definition, if you're having plant-based, you're having lots of fiber. But this is the, the, how the low GI diet works, glycemic index. This is the, uh, the phenomenon you get between eating an orange 
or drinking orange juice. Okay, exactly the same food, but one without fiber and one with fiber. And sugar, and incidentally, there's as much um, sugar in orange juice as there is in Coca-Cola and other sodas, okay? And it's exactly the same sugar, it's not natural sugar. Exactly the same sugar, they might be a little bit more vitamin C, okay? So in terms of, and sugar amounts is exact, exactly the same. The difference between eating an orange versus drinking the juice is the presence of the fiber. And there are a number of different things. The first is you have to chew the fiber, obviously, right? And so the chewing process means that your body, it senses this, your body says, oh, it's chewing, then your body says, okay, Food is about to arrive, prepare to accept food. And so it, it sorts your body out getting ready to do it. The problem with drinking your sugar or drinking your calories is by the time your body realizes what's hit it, it's already been absorbed okay, into it. So that's part, of the, that's part of the issue. The second thing is that the fiber travels down the gut making you feel fuller, so it makes you feel fuller. The second thing. The third thing is that the fiber keeps your gut microbiome happy, you know, and, and, and very, very happy. And so everything is regular and, 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 um, and, and you're happy and you're healthier. So exactly the same food just with the presence of fiber. Huge amount of difference. Plant-based, I've just explained. The Mediterranean diet, now this one has meat in it, right? But there's a lot of whole grains and you're eating stuff. And then there are plant-based, effectively, but with complicated backstory. In particular, it's the alkali diet. Now the alkali diet is another ridiculous diet, so I won't spend too much time on it. But our blood pH level, which measures, which measures the acidity and alkalinity, it's roughly speaking, not roughly, actually, it's pretty precise, 7.4, all right? And uh, so seven is neutral for the, I'm sorry to teach grandmas how to suck eggs, I just make sure everyone knows this. Seven is neutral. If it's higher than seven, it's alkali. If it's lower than seven, it's acidic, okay? So 7.4 means it's slightly alkali. And someone, uh, a chap named Robert Young, who I've interviewed once before, um, decided to think, well, the only way, the way we have to keep our blood alkali is to make sure we eat alkali-based foods. Now, there are two problems with this argument, okay? The first problem is it ignores the presence of the stomach. The stomach is the most acidic component in our entire body, pH 1.5, roughly speaking, battery acid, okay? So everything we eat, whatever the starting pH, is at pH 1.5, and then as it goes from our stomach into our small intestine, it is neutralized to pH 7 so that the enzymes can get to work on it. Every single thing we eat. So this is what happens to everything, whatever the starting, it doesn't change the pH in our blood um, at all. Then the even more ridiculous thing is how they actually, um, the taxonomy of what is alkali and what is, um, and what is acidic. If you go online and just Google images of Gwyneth Paltrow, just stop. Maybe don't do it from your work account. But if you actually Google, and you'll see there's one famous picture um, with her goop. I'll come at the goop in a second. With her goop thing, in which she sat there. She's looking beautiful. Um, she, has a, she has a glass of her high pH water, which she shells for a serious amount of money, right? pH. With a spritz of lemon. Now, the problem, and lemon... <laughs> Now, the problem is, al the people in the alkali diet consider lemons and all citrus fruits to be acidic. Uh, sorry, let me start this again. They, they, they think that all citrus fruits, including lemons, are alkali, which obviously is stupid because uh, a lemon is full of, number one, citric acid, otherwise it's not a cit citrus fruit. Number two, it's full of vitamin C, which is otherwise known as ascorbic. Acid. So my point, I'm not going to go any further because it makes no sense. So, so it's, it's, but why do people do it? People do it because dairy products and meat are considered acidic, okay? Leave aside the fact that they were full of blood, which were alkali. Just, just don't think about it. But the point is, because if you remove dairy products and meat from your diet, you're pretty much plant-based. The reason why the alkali diet works is because, like when I was on a plant-based diet, um, it is largely a plant-based diet, and that's why it actually works. It is high in fiber. Now, just the last two slides, and then I'll, and then I'll shut up, and we'll do, we'll, we'll do, we'll do Q&A. All of this, I am acutely aware that when I'm, I'm doing this talk, and you'll forgive me for judging everyone that is here, okay? But I am going to take a big sweeping judge that all of you are probably, roughly speaking, the same economic class as me, okay? <laughs> middle, all right? So we're all middle, which is why we're here at the, um, which is why we're here at the, at the, at the science festival. And, and a big issue with all this, including the calorie counts on the menus, I would hazard to add, all right? And all of this talk about high protein, high fiber, okay, is the fact that 
it is the middle class that have the time, energy, to actually worry about it. Rich people don't care, okay? Now, they don't care because they have other things to worry about and they have nutritionists and they have chefs, okay? The poor people, lower social class, they don't care either because they're trying to feed their kids, all right? So they're not gonna care uh, about any of the calorie counts. Now, why am I bringing this up now? First of all, because it's annoying to me when people uh, try and preach it. Uh, I know I'm preaching at you now, but I'm preaching it. <laughs> I realize that, but I'm preaching you for a good reason. So, so my, <laughs> so, so look, this, 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 um, and I'm going to tackle just one thing: ultra-processed foods, which I'm only going to do on this slide. I, I, this is not an ultra-processed food talk, okay? But ultra-processed foods are not processed foods, okay? So everything we eat is processed in some way. Bar if you pluck the apple of a tree, that's not processed because you've just plucked it off the tree. But if you've cooked something, if you've pickled something, if you've fermented something, if you've applied heat in any way to something, it is a process. So processed food per se is not the issue. It's ultra-processed foods. Now, ultra-processing is the industrial processing of food that you cannot replicate within a domestic kitchen or most proper restaurants. You can't. There's, it is absolutely impossible um, I mean, to do it because it involves techniques and, and machines that we just don't have. Um, you know, chemically recovered meat, that kind of thing, to make nuggets, that, 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 that kind of thing. The problem is, 50, on average, on average, 50% of our calories okay, that we eat in higher income countries come from ultra processed foods. Now these range not only from chicken nuggets and frozen pizzas, which immediately jumps to your head, I know this, but includes croissant, includes, you know, Müller yogurts, includes, you know, a, a jarred tomato sauces, includes all of the things, okay, that, that, that are there. So we do actually consume quite a bit of ultra processed foods. What is the problem with ultra processed foods? I'm not a food Nazi. The problem with ultra-processed foods is due to the ultra-processing, it is inherently lower in, in fiber and in protein, just, ju just from that. So that's the problem. So they're more calorically available, just as I was talking about. But second, they lack flavor because of the ultra-processing. And because they lack flavor, you have to replace flavor. Where does flavor come from? The holy trinity of sugar, salt, and fat. All right, we have to add back in. And so, Ultra-processed foods are inherently low in protein and fiber and high in sugar, salt, and fat. It's not an issue if you have it as a treat at all. The problem is we have too much of it. So now, now I'm talking about this because from a privileged perspective, the lower socioeconomic, it's cheap because it's industrially processed, long shelf lives, and a lot of people in the lower socioeconomic class have to eat. They have no choice for all the preaching we're gonna do with them, they have no choice, and the likelihood is if you're Mrs. Smith on three minimum wage jobs trying to keep your kids alive, you'll end up getting a stack of frozen pizzas for $2.99 because that will keep your kids alive, all right? And so we need to think about this. And so I guess we have to work within the environment. And people that say, please replace your chocolate bar with a banana, that's a really dumb thing to say. Why? Because sometimes life demands a banana, sometimes life demands a chocolate bar. The question is, can we make a better chocolate bar? Okay, can we add a little bit? It's never gonna be as healthy as a banana, but it sits in a different class of food. Sometimes you are in a chocolate bar mood. Well, can I make a better choice? Can I make a higher fiber, higher protein chocolate bar choice? Just as an example, or lasagna, or pizza, or whatever it is you're, you're, you're actually eating. But I think all of us need to bear in mind when we talk about calorie counts, when we talk about ultra-processed foods, that we are not doing this equitably across all of society. That's all I wanted to say. So look, I think my, my final, now is my final two slides. So is it true, however, that the vast majority of non-communicable diseases, non-infectious diseases, we're clearly in the middle of an infectious disease problem at the moment, is it true that the vast majority of non-communicable diseases are diet-related? Yes, they are. This includes obesity. I work in a government-funded obesity unit. This includes type 2 diabetes, a certain high blood pressure, certain cancers, etc., etc. So we need to fix our diets. But we shouldn't do it by fearing food. Why do we fear food? Let me tell you what fearing food is. Go back to Goop, okay? And I'm not making this up. So Gwyneth Paltrow's Goop, which is her lifestyle webpage, is pushing what, they call, what she calls the leanest, achieving your leanest livable weight. 
Like, if you say that out loud, that's as skinny as you can be without dying. Isn't, isn't that what the leanest livable weight means? So if that doesn't reflect the fear of food, I don't know what, what, what does. So the last big live event I did was for New Scientist Live in 2019 down in London Excel, okay? I, I showed this exact same slide, and there were media in the crowd. They picked up on this. And so they, they said Cambridge, you know, and this, I, I lifted this from the independent. This is Cambridge geneticists in argument with Gwyneth pa I've never met Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> My point is, why are we fearing food? What, everything which I've talked to you about today has nothing about fearing food. All I talked about is to try and understand our food. We need to love our food. Some of us just need to eat a little bit less of our food. I guess that's the issue. So why don't calories count? Calories count because, as I said at the very outset, we eat food. We don't eat calories. Please, this is absolutely critical and important. So we need to think about the quality of our food, not simply the calorie counts that are, uh, um, that are there. And if you focus on your health, people talk about weight too much. They talk about weight too much. Yes, some of us are carrying too much fat. How much fat is too much fat? It depends on who you are, all right? It does make a difference who you are. Are you Polynesian? Are you South Asian? Are you East Asian? Are you white? It depends on who you are, all right? But if you focus on your health, are you healthy? Can you carry your kids up the stairs, your grandkids? Can you go for a run? And if you can, and I wish I could lose half a stone, but I'm relatively healthy, I wish I could look like Brad Pitt, but I don't. These are the things, right? Well, if you focus on your health, your weight will take care of itself. So folks, this is the book, but my last three thoughts, and then I'll shut the hell up. So what should we be counting instead of calories? Let's be positive. Now, this is me in my positive mode, all right? Well, I think there are some numbers we should think about, okay? 16, this is the sweet spot of the amount of protein we should be trying to aim for. Now, when I say protein, I don't necessarily mean steak. It could be a steak, but then there's the problem with saturated fats. I'm talking about tofu, pulses, any source of protein from anything with a face or anything without a, without a face. 16%. There's a sweet spot. Don't have too much. Don't have too little. 30 grams of fiber. Now, this, more the better. All right, at the moment here, we're probably averaging 15 grams. We need to double the amount of fiber that we actually eat. The more, the merrier. Five, this is the, num this is the percent of free sugars or added sugars. So these are sugars in orange juice, in honey, uh, in the white powdered stuff, as opposed to something tied up with fiber. So anything in a fruit that has the fiber doesn't count as a free sugar. Keep your free sugars to less than 5% of your daily energy intake. And this is just a suggestion. Perhaps consider meat-free days just to drop down on A, for the environment, and B, probably a little bit for, 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 for our health. So I've only had 45 minutes with you. I'm good Q&A now. But I also have a podcast called Dr. Giles, you choose the fat. <laughs> Um, available on whatever, Spotify, uh, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts, then you get me for hours banging on at you. <laughs> so, um, folks, my name is Giles Yeo. It's been a distinct pleasure. Let's get some questions. <laughs> uh, who has a question? Lady in the front over here with the lovely... B, right? Can you have too much protein? Uh, yes, you can. And you can have too much protein. Um, I mean, there's two. Look, you can definitely have too much animal based protein because land based, animal based protein, fish is a very different scenario because of the presence of saturated fats. So that's one problem. But you can, have, you can, you can also have too much plant-based protein. The, the key thing here is because your body has to work to get rid of the nitrogen. So there is a limit. Depends what you're doing. If you are lifting a lot, pardon me, you don't look like you're lifting a lot, but if you're <laughs> lifting, if you're, if you're Arnold or, or, or The Rock, well, then you do want to get more protein because you're using it. You're not getting rid of the protein. You're actually building it. So in a normal uh, um, mortals, 16% uh, is the sweet spot because too much can actually increase risk of certain types of cancers, bowel cancers, and, and put problems in your kidneys. Too much for too long. Too much for too long. That's what I mean. Yep. Other questions? Um, can I ask you about sugar? Go, yep. Um, so can I ask you about artificial sweeteners? Okay. Um, I understand that most artificial sweeteners are not good for you, but they've got no calories in them, so I get confused. So there are a couple of things. First of all, um, there is... I think there's slight scaremongering where people say the first thing about artificial sweeteners people always say is they're cancerous, they're cancerous. Um, and, and the studies, they are cancerous. 
But the studies in which they actually are done to show they're cancerous, equivalently take a rat or a mouse and you put the equivalent of 100 liters of Diet Coke with a f artificial, artificial sweeteners into them. It's, it's, it'd be, it would be cancerous. But at the levels we're eating, I don't think they are actually um, um, drinking them, we're not. So what is the problem with artificial sweeteners? Um, the problem with, art of, look, when, what is, sugar is one of the tastes, it's one of the flavors, so therefore is one of the things we judge the quality, the type, the energy content of the food. And so sweet means more calories to our primitive brain. So the, the question is whether or not when you break that connection, because obviously it has no calories, does it begin to put um, stress on the metabolic balance pathways? Um, the work in humans is not, it is not so good because humans are difficult to work with, but work in mice certainly point to this being the situation, but emerging data is beginning to point out that actually long-term use of, um, of artificial sweetness at volume can begin to mess about with your metabolic, um, um, metabolic pathways. However, once again, when people ask, let's take vaping just as an example. Is vaping good for you compared to what? Okay, compared to a cigarette, yes. Compared to not vaping, no. Okay, are artificial sweeteners good or bad for you compared to what? Okay, and I think if, if you're in a situation where either you're, type, you're diabetic or you wanna try and begin to reduce the sugar content, I think as a stepping stone to getting weaning yourself off sugar, because sugar is something that you can actually get yourself the flavor of, um, then, then I think that is something you said. Sorry, that was a rather nuanced answer. I'm gonna have to give shorter answers. Short answers, short answers, yeah. Could we take one online, if that's yep. all right? We've got quite a few online. Oh, okay. Um, but I think I'm going to go with one of the more popular ones, which is, um, what is the significance and reason for adding calories to the menus? Um, okay, I, I know where the work came from. So let, let's, everyone take a step. A, a, a step back, particularly if my, my epidemiological colleagues are here. So, so the key piece of study that, that, that was done, was actually done here in Cambridge, has shown that calories at point of purchase, if you go to Costa or Starbucks and you see that a blueberry muffin is 400 calories, you go, <gasps> okay? So first thing, that's what they're trying to do. And then, and then actually they've shown, my, my colleagues have shown that this reduces on average the chances of buying and presumably consuming said muffin by 8%. Okay, so this is where I think part of the work is coming from. So can we scare people into actually ordering, but uh, into ordering less? A couple of problems that I actually have with this, with, with this scenario. The coffee shop scenario is a slightly different f um, um, f phenomenon because you never come, and, and, and it's, well, I'm not gonna buy the, I'm not gonna buy the muffin. I'll just have my coffee and I'll, and, and, and I'll walk away. Whereas when you're actually, there, this, is, this is, I have to say it's editorial. This is just me thinking about it. This is one of the questions I answered over the week is if you're actually going to, um, going to a restaurant, you have to, you're there to eat, all right? Well, then what are you going to eat? Are you going to say that, well, I'm just going to use purely the calories to eat something less of, because that's, you're still eating. Now, here is where the problem lies, where because of this whole lecture I've just given, just because you picked the lower calorie option, because you can have a fully vegan meal, which is gonna contain as much calories or more than something else you're eating. So that is my problem with the calorie count. What, what would I suggest? May I humbly suggest, no one's listening to me, but I would suggest that the traffic light signal, but not showing what is shown at the moment. Because you have to remember that we already have the calorie counts in 90% of the foods that we face every single day anyway. They're there, okay, it's already law. We still have obesity as a problem. So I think it's not an issue of calorie counts that are the issue, we're, we are highlighting the wrong information. Man, I humbly suggest we do a traffic light system on my last few numbers there, okay? The amount of protein, the amount of free sugars, and the amount of fiber that's actually in the food. So imagine now a restaurant scenario, but in traffic lights, because seven grams of fiber, you have no idea what that means. Whereas if someone has calculated and says this is amber versus green, or red versus green, then when you go for a restaurant meal, your dessert is always gonna be red for sugar, otherwise it's a pretty crap dessert, I wanna point out, right? Okay, so, so you know that, you know that, right? You know that, okay, well, so maybe I'm gonna make a different decision, color combination decision for my starter or for my main, and then we're thinking about the quality of the food we're eating rather than just the calorie counts. I think it's the wrong information that's being put out there. Sorry, it's a very long answer, but I thought it was important given the, given the context. Oh, sorry, I, I, I'll, I'll keep my hands down. 
Can you talk a little bit more about the importance or not of probiotics? Oh, um, <laughs> I guess it depends what kind of probiotics. There are some expensive probiotics out there, okay? Um, and I won't, I won't name them, I don't want to be sued. Um, I actually was at a, at a meeting once um, in which one of the major companies, Yakult, I'll say it, what Yakult was there. Um, um, and, and their scientists were, were, were talking, and I raised, this was a scientific meeting, and they were there answering questions, they weren't trying to, and I said, how many colony-forming units, how many bugs per mill, okay, do you have to put into Yakult? I'm not trying to scare people away from drinking Yakult. How many con colony-forming units? You have 64 billion. Now, if you actually have, so Yakult has a minimum of 64 billion bacteria per mill, so that tens make it into the gut in order to do the thing, okay? So I, I just think that probiotics from the expensive uh, companies are not probably worth, they're not bad for you, they're probably not worth the money. Let me tell you the best and cheapest probiotics in the whole world, vegetables, as much as possible in different colors. And so therefore, that's the best probiotics that, that, that I would use. And no one is paying me to say that because there is no big vegetable. <laughs> Behind you. Uh, oh. Oh. Uh, I had a two-part question. So my first question was, um, how, like, what role do genetics play in how you metabolize food and, okay. like, digest food? And the yep. second was obviously genetics interact with the environment around you. So how much of an impact can you change on, like, I suppose your what you take from calories in a food. Okay, and those are very good questions. I'll deal with the first one, first, first one first. There are going to be differences in our efficiency, I'm going to call that, of, of efficiency and partitioning of what we do with food. Efficiency means um, um, how much you can do with a given calorie that's, that's in you, and, and partitioning means when you eat a, a given calorie, how much do you burn, how much do you store? Okay, there are going to be genetics underlying it, not as much as people think, <laughs> okay, but there is a difference. All right, there, 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 there is a difference. The bigger difference is from, is from food intake, uh, but on average, that is the huge difference because we are, we are designed to eat foods a lot quicker. 250 calories, chocolate bar, 60 seconds for me. <laughs> Half an hour on a treadmill, okay? It always takes longer to burn it than to, than to eat it. So there is a difference, um, and there are differences amongst, amongst us, but not as big, okay? Now, the second thing with regards to the environment, that's a very interesting question, all right? Um, that plays a huge role. So just let's go back to socioeconomic class as a key in, environmental driver, okay, where those in the, lo the lowest decile, the 10% of, of, um, of privilege, of, of actually, you know, of, of poverty in this country, are twice as likely to end up with obesity, and actually most other diseases, I want to point out, but twice as likely to end up with obesity than us sat here. Okay, genetically, there is no difference between rich and poor, or middle class and poor, accident of birth. But yet, there is a huge difference. A, a, a colleague of mine, and Professor Claire Llewellyn, um, she runs a twin cohort down at UCL, University College London, called Gemini. You guys can go Google this, the star constellation, Gemini. And this twin cohort she uses to, to study uh, uh, identical twins, non-identical twins, genes versus the environment. But the interesting thing is she has socioeconomic uh, um, um, questionnaires for these, for these twins. If you go, so the heritability of body weight, so the percentage of the variation that's down to genes versus environment is 40 to 70%. So why is there a range? There's a range because of the environment. If you go to the poorest households, the households with the worst environment, for food, they, you max out the heritability of body weight to 70%. Whereas if you go to our households, suddenly the heritability, which are your genes, okay, of body weight drops to 40%. Okay? And so what happens here is poverty accounts for, slightly crudely, but on average, 40, 30 to 40% of, of uh, the, the likelihood of obesity. And why? Okay, so I guess if you are more susceptible. This is how I, I contextualize it in my head. If you are more susceptible to saying yes to food, you, you're just more driven towards food, then it makes a difference if you're in an inner city food desert next to the kebab shop versus at home in a Cambridge village with carrot and hummus in your fridge. Okay? And so I think if you actually have the access to the right types of foods, it, makes, it actually does make a very, very big difference. And, so, and I just want to point out when I'll, then I'll, I promise, I'll, I'll, I won't shut up, but I promise I'll stop talking about this. And poverty, I want to point out, ladies and gentlemen, and to all of you online, poverty is a political choice. 
Okay, we can fix it with just choosing not to. And so I think that is a, I think that is a crime. Anyway, sorry, very long answer. You got me on my hobby horse. Woo! So, questions? Thank you. Um, is, I feel that if I eat or drink at different times of day, uh, it has a different reaction. Is that because my body's um, reacting to it and digesting it differently? Ah, okay, so when e eating... Yeah, during, if, if I eat lunchtime or if I eat in the evening. Okay, so, uh, I, I, it, down so it doesn't... It does make a difference. It doesn't, it's, once again, it's probably not as much as you might imagine, but it does make a difference. And it makes a difference when you eat for the very simple reason is that we're diurnal creatures. We tend to be awake in the, in the, in the daytime and asleep at night. And so our metabolic rate is lowest when we're asleep, but uh, highest when we're awake so we can avoid becoming food and look for food. And so if you clearly you have big breakfasts, then you have the whole day to burn the food. Whereas if your biggest meal is dinner, which is culturally what we do now, then you have a little bit of time to burn the food and then you sleep and then you, you store the food. Now, the reason why it's not as much as you might imagine is because at some point energy balance takes over. But it explains why shift workers um, in particular have from an epidemiological population basis have a higher risk for metabolic disease. So it does make a difference when and what you eat during the day. When you have your, and this is now very individual. So, so when I, I cycle to work and cycle home from work, but I know that if I hit my hungry patch at 4 p.m., say, all right, before, before I cycle home, if I crack and have a cookie or that 60-second chocolate bar, I will feel wobbly on my bike. Don't ask me why. This is just my, this is just my, my biology. Whereas if I make it through without having anything sweet, even if I eat something else, then I feel perfectly fine on my bike. So I don't know why, that's my internal biology. So eat, when you eat does matter, just not as much as some people think. Uh, can I just ask a question? I know we're online and I know, know we're here. How, uh, um, we've gone to zero. How long, how many questions more can I ask, answer before I? I think we will probably need to only take one or two one. more because we do have another event at 7. Okay, and I'm, I'm happy to stand outside and answer, and answer. I've got to go by seven. I shouldn't be telling anybody this. <laughs> I'm happy to answer questions outside if you, if you wish. Okay, one more question. Shall we go for online or, or live? Let's go live, let's go live. You, you paid for parking and what have you. <laughs> I'll answer the questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, that was a very inspiring talk, and I do agree that we do not seem to overcome the power poverty in this country. I agree. Uh, the question is, uh, given that the current government and probably the future government won't have the resources or desire to overcome the poverty, uh, is there anything you could see could be done to like, shift the nutritional balance of the cheap foods, which are currently people forced to buy, starting with crepe sandwiches, burgers, whatever else, what you normally see on the conveyor belt? So this is an... Excellent a question. And so if pe people ask what, so it's, it's sort of another, I'll, I'll re, re say the question to you that I've been asked before, in fact, I was asked this week. What, what would I do to solve obesity? Okay, now keeping in mind the equitable question, is I think clearly it's gonna be more complex than this, but I think one of the easiest wins that we can do, I don't know if it's deliverable, okay, is to subsidize healthy food. Now, I don't only mean carrots, I mean the healthier end of all ranges of food. So that when the notional Mrs. Smith goes into a supermarket, she does not want to be prescribed a carrot. She does not want to be given a box of food. You lose dignity, okay? You lose agency over your life. You want to be able to go into a supermarket like everybody else and pick your food, all right? And, but you just happen to have less cash. And so I think in order to do that, you've got to make the healthier food cheaper. Now, people say, well, why don't you make the unhealthy food more expensive? You can do that, but you can only do that when you make the healthier food cheaper, because otherwise it always disproportionately affects the poor. And that way, there is a bar. And that bar is if your choices are limited, you're always going to have something healthy. If you're us and can afford to buy what we want when we want, this is a different set of problems, okay? Maybe the calorie counts will work better for us, I don't know. But that will be my answer. I think the easiest thing is to make healthier food cheaper, subsidize it, um, and by all means tax the more expensive, uh, uh, the, 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 the more, unhealthy, more unhealthy foods. Um, I don't know if it's deliverable, but that would be my two pence if I was PM for the day. Is that it? That's it, thank you so much.